It's a real pleasure to um, present on behalf of a team of biomedical engineers, physicists, and, and clinicians, a team that uh, developed uh, an algorithm to try and diagnose uh, Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, as you will hear um, in, in this webinar, is one of the most challenging diseases of our times and um, the uh, most common cause of dementia worldwide is characterized by progressive cognitive impairment and brain atrophy. And indeed, it is, uh, it, it is thought that that the diagnosis uh, of the disease is presumptive uh, until confirmation on autopsy. And at autopsy, uh, you can see a range of uh, shrinkage of, of the hippocampus and related regions, uh, but, but also um, you can see um, uh, plaques uh, that have one of the proteins characteristic of Alzheimer's, beta amyloid, and tangles uh, containing a protein called tau, and these are characteristic of the disease. And that has led to these types of curves to try and understand biomarker changes um, across the spectrum uh, of, uh, from healthy to uh, disease. And, and these biomarkers include the amyloid uh, biomarkers, both in terms of uh, characterizing them from cerebrospinal fluid, as well as PET scans. Um, same with tau, uh, but also MRI is routine here, um, uh, standard MRI and, um, and FDG PET, as well as various cognitive tests. It is increasingly taught that neuroinflammatory changes also underpin early stages of, of this disease. So uh, the question is, um, uh, what's the problem if we have all these biomarkers? And, and, and the issue is, is that still a, a number of patients uh, are misdiagnosed, 20% uh, of patients. A number of patients are underdiagnosed, and this, uh, that's 40% of patients. And there is a whole array of delayed diagnosis factors, including both physician and patient factors, um, language barriers, and so on. And I uh, um, just want to thank uh, Zani Wen, who reads some of these scans within the trust, who, who gave me these. Um, just to carry on, a new test would avoid, and a new single non-invasive test would avoid uh, of course, less invasive investigations, reduce uh, the number of tests overall, and there's a whole raft of tests that are undertaken. And regarding interventions uh, would help um, with both disease modifying and the current non-disease modifying uh, drug interventions, as well as non-drug interventions and active packages uh, support networks, et cetera. So in considering those opportunities, we decided to go for MRI as a substrate to develop the AI technology, primarily because um, MRI is routine in the clinical management of the disease, although it's a slightly higher bar than you would, for instance, a blood test. But uh, we felt that since most patients would have MRI that uh, we could mine this data sets for, uh, for an algorithm. And it's, it's impressive if when you consider the similarities between the brain and, and the universe. Um, and the, the, types of analyt uh, the types of analytics that are used to characterize the clusters and superclusters and filaments within the universe by astrophysicists could effectively be used as well to characterize the, the brain. They're very similar in terms of uh, the structure. And so um, we've been trying to um, figure out the use of these types of uh, analytics that astrophysicists use uh, to characterize uh, the brain in this case. Um, we will generate features, 
and and run the kind of casual spot the pattern uh, sort of um, um, approach, um, but in this case, um, using several equations uh, in a in a in a uh, field called radiomics. So, what's radiomics? is a uh, is a new uh, field, relatively new field uh, that takes an image and creates a high dimensional feature space, and that allows us to almost work with images in much the same way as you work with other omics, such as genomics and proteomics. And we think that we can see changes that are below uh, the level of uh, visibility of the, of the human eye. Um, and in this case, uh, in this specific example here, one of the first to publish a radiomics paper, uh, Seagal and co-workers were able to decode global gene expression using uh, imaging uh, data. So quite powerful way to use existing uh, data sets that patients have anyway uh, to really characterize disease in a, in, a, in a different way. And our starting point really as a group was in ovarian cancer, where we managed to develop this radiomics approach uh, and the software to go with that. And, and just highlighting the team of radiologists, surgeons, oncologists, uh, basic scientists, biomedical engineers who contributed to this. But the two points I want to make is uh, are that if you take a look at even a small part of this image, and this is a patient with ovarian cancer, the, the pelvis is filled with disease. Just a small bit of this already shows you quite a degree of heterogeneity that you can mine to really understand that disease. And the second bit is to develop software that would automatically do this kind of analysis. Um, we decided to stick with uh, equations that we understand in biophysical space, so that at the end of the day, we can see which biophysical changes occur and how that relates to biology. Of course, in our group and several groups around the world, deep learning is the way to, to, to go these days uh, for AI. Uh, but we decided on this high, number of handcrafted constrained features uh, so that we could explain uh, what we see at the end of the day. So this is just putting intensities on, on, the, uh, on the map and then characterizing them. So what did we do for AD? Um, so Mariana Inglesi, who worked on this project, uh, took the uh, a number of data sets which are internationally available um, one of them is the ADNI data set, uh, as well as disease uh, neuroimaging initiative, that a number of people around the world, including industry and academia, have banked. So the loss of MRIs banked, well characterized as the disease state. Um, and so we took that. Um, and then she trained uh, on a number of these, uh, and she also tested on a, a separate number of these. Um, so one of the things that she did, which I think is, is really important, is that in the not disease cohort, so the disease cohort would be those with early disease uh, uh, called MCI and those with late disease, AD, uh, but the in the almost the non-disease cohort, she also mixed them with patients who might have other diseases, such as Parkinson's or from temporal dementia, or other forms, other diseases which um, would not. So patients may come into the clinic having some of these diseases, and she wanted to really have context in what she uh, she really uh, detects at the end of the day. And, and so she extracted the images, she passed it through to create features uh, on different brain regions. And then um, she uh, used a dimension reduction approach to reduce the features into those that were relevant and characterize two aspects of the disease. One is, can she differentiate between not disease pathology and disease pathology, be it early or late. And the other is to grade uh, the disease in those who have the disease pathology. 
So uh, here are some data. Um, so um, uh, she, in this approach, you come across uh, different uh, types of statistics. Uh, some are very basic, so just the average of the image across that region of the brain, um, but more complex ones as well. Uh, and I'm showing some of these. Uh, for instance, what are the, the relationships between uh, co-occurring types of intensities within the image in this gray level co-occurrence matrix? Uh, what are the repeats of gray level runs? Uh, so you can see some runs here, 333. Three, three, and again, that gives you an understanding of that heterogeneity within those volumes. Um, and the last one relates to uh, zones that are different within the image. Uh, there are also other analytics such as fractals, which describe uh, the way that um, the space filling properties of any object. So you can have these 660 different equations, um, and those are just calculated by software that we developed in the, in the earlier periods. And when you apply all this, you get uh, what is effectively uh, the weights and uh, which we call uh, uh, the non-zero coefficients and, um, and also the parts of the brains uh, and those uh, which are related to those weights. This was quite interesting in its own right in that there were regions that we already knew, knew about. Um, so the hippocampus, for instance, but there were several other regions that were also elaborated. And two other points that, that I, I wish to make is that she put in age as a feature, which was not selected. Um, age is known to be a strong um, factor um, uh, covariate in these studies. Uh, she put in CSF amyloid beta, which was also not selected by this model. It may be that uh, because we selected 50 to 90 year olds to study that um, this has reduced age and the role of age in, this, in these models. Or it may be that um, um, those other variables are very powerful in asserting the, uh, the diagnostic um, properties of, uh, of disease brain. So uh, here are some rock calves, uh, which we would do typically. And you can see in, uh, in four that we can uh, discriminate between not Alzheimer's related pathology and Alzheimer's related pathology quite well. And, and this, this sort of phylogenic tree here is our attempt to depict any brain and uh, how that brain uh, is able to be used uh, to diagnose uh, the disease. So um, some further data, uh, the accuracy of the method in the training set was very high. And in, a, in an unseen um, um, ex, uh, validation set was also very high. Um, uh, so I, in the sort of high 90s. Um, and also uh, in other unseen data sets uh, were also uh, relatively high. Uh, where we failed was in using the algorithm uh, to look at an unseen data set of three Tesla. Everything to date have been 1.5 Tesla MRI scans. So we concluded that at least in this current form, uh, the algorithm does not uh, do very well uh, when presented with 3T image data. Um, having said that, um, the algorithm was superior to the standard clinical way of judging these images, uh, which is uh, hippocampal atrophy. And there, uh, if you took the same data set, uh, hippocampal atrophy was only 26% accurate. Uh, CSF uh, uh, beta amyloid was only 62% accurate. So these are much um, inferior to the composite measure uh, determined uh, for, from, from these studies. Um, two other things were that um, the, the algorithm uh, correlated quite well with neuronal loss and it was reproducible. 
So here is the paper. Uh, I encourage you to uh, take a look. And so what I've been saying is that we've tried to have a one-stop shop diagnosis with high accuracy, and at least in internal unseen sets, we are up to 98% accurate. Uh, we can get to 80s uh, with external sets. Um, in terms of grading, we are less accurate, but you can appreciate that grading is a continuum from um, from healthy to uh, to full disease. Um, so we are less accurate when MRI only is used. Uh, but when we combine that with uh, memory scores, then that is that gets into into the 90s, which is great. Um, the test is superior to um, current tests, um, including hippocampal atrophy and uh, beta amyloid, uh, CSF beta amyloid, and it highlights areas that we can begin to research into, uh, such as the cerebellum and uh, the ventral diencephalon. And we did some additional uh, GWAS studies uh, to support a role of uh, SNP, uh, TOM40 uh, SNP, uh, which interestingly becomes non-significant uh, when you um, uh, when you link it with apoE uh, uh, apoE enzyme. So there may be a linkage association. So what are the next steps? The next steps are uh, developing a touch button pipeline and locking that process down, uh, deploying it initially in ICHT um, and, and, and also really scrutinizing the tests with additional data sets. So these are all ongoing. Um, another um, um, aspect is to reduce the time it takes uh, to process these data primarily due to a uh, software called FreeServe, which is a third-party software that the algorithm has to go and call uh, before it's, it uh, divides the brain into different parts. Further down the line, we wish to uh, look to regulatory um, aspects of this to make the tests more widely available. Um, uh, create additional algorithm. We feel that um, if we can create multiple algorithm, then we'll have multiple readers uh, that can really inform. And these are computer readers that can inform on the disease. And, and perhaps begin to look at uh, early detection of the disease using these methods. So I want to thank all the, the team, fabulous team. Uh, and you can see that there are several college and trust employees who contributed to this work. Um, and I want to thank the DRC who funded uh, the, the team to do the work. So thank you for your attention.